In this module, we will be looking at the normal waveforms of an ECG tracing. The isoelectric line is where we were going to start. We often refer to this as baseline. It is that straight line that would appear if there were no deflections present, so no upward or downward movement on the ECG tracing. It is usually found mid-height of an ECG strip with a zero net amplitude. Remember, we did talk about amplitude in a previous lesson, um, but we're not measuring that in most of our rhythms. Anything above this line is considered a positive deflection. So here's the isoelectric line, this blue line. Anything above is a positive deflection. Anything below is a negative deflection. Now, not all ECGs have an easily identifiable isoelectric line. It would be great if they did. So we're gonna look at two examples. The first one here is a wandering baseline. So you'll notice here, um, now this is not lead two, there's lead one, lead two, lead three. But even in lead two, I can't just draw a straight line all the way across because it kind of dips down. And so this would be a difficult one to find the isoelectric line, but not a difficult one to analyze because we can still see very distinctive waveforms that we can measure. Artifact happens when people are moving, maybe they're shivering or they're tapping their foot. Then that we can get this little vibration happening in the waveform. Again, we're looking at line two or lead two. We see this vibration. It's really hard to identify some of the particular features and that can cause a little bit of a challenge. So let's start looking at what the normal waveforms are. The first one that we should see is the P wave. Now this is round and upright as you can see. So there's my isoelectric line. And then the first positive deflection off, usually it is round and upright. That would be the normal. And then the, the, when it comes back to baseline, that is the end of our P wave. There should be one for every QRS, and this is my QRS, and it should come before that QRS complex. And when you look across an ECG, so the next waveform would appear, it should look the same. Now this is representing the conduction of an electrical impulse that starts in the SA node, and it's traveled down the internodal tracks, Bachmann's bundle, and is now sitting at the AV node. So this is the mechanical, this would represent the mechanical contraction of the atria. The next is the QRS complex. I mentioned that the P wave comes before every QRS. So this here is our QRS. It begins with the first deflection off isoelectric line after the P wave. So here's my P wave, atrial contraction. This line here, the straight isoelectric line, represents the amount of time that energy is held at the AV node. And then as it releases it, our QRS begins with the first deflection off isoelectric line past the P wave. Now this generally is a negative deflection. There can be no net negative. It can also just go straight up. Essentially, we're just looking for the first deflection off isoelectric. It includes the R, and the S, and when it returns to isoelectric line, that would be the end of our QRS complex. If we were to measure this and take our calipers out or our sheet of paper, this would be between 0 0.06, so one and a half small boxes, to 0.12 seconds, that would be three small boxes in duration. Now the amplitude is generally five to 30 millimeters, and we're not gonna measure that in this course, we're, we're not gonna focus on amplitude until we get to only one particular element. So we'll just note that that would be a normal amplitude and move on. Again, this should be consistent all the way across your ECG. They should look the same. This is the part that is responsible for ventricular contraction or depolarization. Following that, we see that we return to isoelectric line and then we have another positive round upright waveform. This would be known as the T wave, and this is when the ventricles are relaxing. And so this should be occur after every QRS waveform, round and upright is the normal. It should be similar to the P wave in terms of how high it is, its amplitude, and again, consistent across the entire ECG tracing. 
Now we also have some intervals. Remember I mentioned that from the SA node to the AV node, there's a certain amount of time that it takes to contract and then the AV node will hold on just a wee little bit. Well, we actually have some measurements we want to do. Starting from the beginning of the P wave and including that isoelectric line after the P wave, when the energy is being held at the AV node, we want to measure that interval. Now, typically in a normal, healthy individual, it's between 0.12 seconds, so that's three small boxes, to 0 0.20 seconds, that's five small boxes or one large box. So you would put your calipers at the beginning of the P wave, uh, including the arch, including the flat line, and as soon as it leaves isoelectric, that's where you would stop to measure. Again, this should be consistent all the way across. And this is telling you the amount of time it takes for the SA node to initiate an impulse, the atria to transfer that impulse down to the AV node, and the AV node to hold it. This would be in conjunction if you were to do a mechanical look at the heart, the atria would be contracting. The next waveform is called the QT interval. So we want to measure the entire cycle it takes for the ventricles to contract and relax. Heart. So here we're seeing that the energy is being released from the AV node, traveling down through the ventricles, contracting and disbanding. Should be taking between 0.36 to 0.44 seconds. And again, consistent all the way across the ECG. Now, sometimes we have to correct this number. And it happens when we have a really slow heart rate and a really fast heart rate. The QT corrected is equal to the measurement you have of the QT in seconds. So how long was that contraction and relaxation phase? And then we divide that by the square root of the R to R value in seconds. Let me go back one slide. So we would then measure this R and we go to the next R and we calculate how much time is in there and do a square root. Now I know some of you are thinking, oh my God, this is math. It is, it doesn't happen very often. Just know that it exists and you'll have some time to practice that in your, in your package. The ST segment is a place of flat isoelectric, no net movement in the heart for electricity. It is between the QRS complex, so as soon as it comes back to isoelectric line and it goes until the repolarization phase, the resting phase of the ventricles, where that T wave leaves. We don't measure its duration, we look at its amplitude and we should find that that is a flat line and it is the same as the isoelectric line pre-complex. When the ST segment is not on baseline, then we wanna to look to see if it's elevated or if it's below the baseline. So here we have an example where it's elevated. So I have my isoelectric line and all of a sudden, whoa, where did that ST line go? Whew, that's pretty high up there. This would be called ST elevation because it's above baseline. Now an ST segment is considered elevated when it is greater than one millimeter and one millimeter is the same as one small square above baseline. So it doesn't have to go very far in order to be considered an elevation. Again, this may also be normal in young healthy adults, so you just wanna make sure it's matching the clinical picture. ST segment depression is when the ST segment goes below isoelectric or baseline. And so here we have our isoelectric line and you're like, well, I expect to see it right here, but it's not there. In fact, it's below. And so it doesn't have to even go below as far as the elevation. It only has to go below 0.5 of a millimeter, which is half of a small box. That's it. So this line is pretty sensitive and it's a great indicator that tells us whether or not we have injury and insult in the myocardial tissues. Now, just to note here, there is changes that can exist in the ST segment as it relates to drug therapy. So digoxin toxicity may actually show up in the ST area as well. Next, we're gonna be moving on to our eight-step process to analyzing a strip. 